A bottle of wine can be extremely prized. Its value earned through a combination of studied grape selection, careful cultivation, and calculated fermentation. The process can take dozens, even hundreds of years to produce the end result. Those who commit themselves to its production possess a unique combination of skills. An expert wine dresser should carefully prepare the soil, parse the weather reports, and study temperature gauges. He must meticulously monitor and tend the grapes as they traverse each stage, from seeding to vine, through harvest to yield, and beyond. The culmination of growing season is just a start, as the wine will mature through years of additional phases before it's ready to be poured. When that moment finally arrives, the nectar of the gods can finally be enjoyed, only because someone diligently and actively tended the process. Many of the world's great vineyards are family businesses, with the first vintage dating back many decades. The legacy is carried forth with pride and seriousness, with each generation keenly aware that the label on the bottle and the contents within must meet an exacting standard established by their forebears. Families are not unlike these prized vineyards. Cultivating healthy relationships and building a positive legacy can be as challenging as keeping up an actual vineyard. Our children and grandchildren will one day inherit what we give them. Sadly, many of us don't approach it that way. We don't slow down enough to treat our parenting responsibilities with the meticulous attention they deserve. For others, we are repeating unhealthy patterns that we saw in our fathers or their fathers. And the result is a sour crop. Just like a great wine can enhance a good meal, healthy relationships are vital to a good life. But part of developing great relationships is knowing how to honor what our parents gave us in the past and leave behind the patterns that don't serve us in the present. Around 600 BC, God appeared to the prophet Ezekiel and told him that his people were created to be a vibrant vineyard, but a lack of attention had left them a withered vine, devoid of fruit. His people were not examining their lives and generational patterns Instead of introspection, they chose complacency. There was a common proverb in those days. Because the parents ate sour grapes, the children's teeth are stained. This was a phrase used to explain away bad tempers or poor listening skills or lack of sensitivity in marriage. In other words, blame it on mom and dad. Because the parents were irresponsible, the children and grandchildren are irresponsible too. God told him to stop using this proverb. Instead, they were to examine their forefathers' behaviors and choose to live differently, consciously communicate better, be more attentive to each other, lead a more righteous life, follow a different path. For those who listened and cultivated their family vineyard in this way, the yield of this fresh harvest was better marriages, deeper friendships, and stronger families. God produced in them the finest of fine wines. Well, man, I have always loved Billy Joel, but somehow in all my years living with Billy Joel, I'd missed that song. And as we began to put together this series, Kenny and the team said, we've got to do the song by Billy Joel. It's all about fine wine. It's about meeting together at your favorite restaurant and talking about what makes relationships work. Those couples that were the king and queen of prom who seemed to have everything together, all the outside worked, and everybody thought they were going to make it, and then you wondered, oh my goodness, I found out years later they got divorced. What happened? Like I love the line, uh, Billy Joel says, things are okay with me these days. I got a good job, I got a good office, I got a great wife and a new life, and the family's fine. From the outside, everything looked great. I think that's a lot of us, especially on Sundays, you dress up, you look your best. You don't want people to know you just fought with your spouse before you came in the, into the chapel. You know, we don't fight, no, we're fine. But he says then, we never knew we could want more than that out of life. But that same couple that looked like on the outside they were doing well, they lived for a while in very nice style, but it's always the same in the end. They got a divorce as a matter of course. Our Fine Wine series is really going to be about how we can dig deep into our own past and learn how 
What forces have shaped us to be who we are today? What are those forces uh, that were modeled for us that maybe have become so unconscious that we don't even realize they've shaped who we are? I remember a friend I worked with, he was uh, worked in the oil industry up in the Shetland Islands, and he was sharing one day just how he was having such a tough time connecting with his teenager. His teenager had some learning disabilities, and, and he just found himself being incredibly impatient. Instead of helping, they always got into a fight. He found himself just not really emotionally available the way he wanted to be. I mean, he generally wanted to be with his, with his son and even with his wife. And he just found himself stuck. And as he went on this journey to figure out why, uh, he shared with me a little bit about what in his past he was trying to work through and how he was working through it in order to be the kind of person he wanted. He said when he was in eighth grade, his dad wasn't around a lot because he worked an awful lot. And so he loved his dad, he liked his dad, he appreciated his dad, he just didn't really know his dad a lot. Well, one day in eighth grade, he was walking through the streets of London where he lived, and he looked up and he saw his father in a bus driving by. And he thought, well, dad must be at work. And then he noticed that dad was sitting next to another woman that wasn't his mom, which was odd. Then he noticed in that same moment that his dad was sitting with another woman and with kids that weren't his brothers and sisters. And he then came home and asked some questions that night at dinner that unleashed this family secret that dad actually had two families on two sides of London, two marriages, two families. And, of course, all of the anger, all of the resentment, all of the bitterness, and the fact that he's sort of the one that spilled the beans on this whole thing and all of the turmoil that came in. And he said, I realized some of the reasons I'm so guarded today is because I've been hurt so bad in the past. He said, what I realized is I've worked through my anger over the years and learning how to love my dad, how to forgive my dad. He said, it began with one step. I said, what's that? He said, I first had to learn how to honor my dad. Come on. He said, there was so much anger. There was so much bad stuff that came through the root of the vine into my life. In order to free myself or unlock myself from bitterness, I first had to humanize my dad and try and find a few things I could see that he did right before I could work through what he did wrong. It was fascinating to me. Same thing we're going to look at today. A great wine dresser, a great wine maker, knows how to find ripe grapes in the vineyard, even amongst the sour grapes. And for some of us, we look at our family of vineyard and we go, oh my goodness, there's so much great stuff that's passed on to me. It's hard for me to find a sour grape. Others of us were like, there's so much sour grape in my vineyard and it's hard to find a ripe grape. So some weeks we're going to focus, like today, on how to honor and find the ripe grapes amongst the sour grapes. Other weeks we're going to look at specific patterns of sour grapes that we want to make sure don't get passed on to the next generation. So today we're going to scour the vineyard of our own lives, and we're going to look specifically for ripe grapes and how to honor those who came before us. This is not going to be a series about blaming or about demonizing our parents, thank goodness, because we don't want our kids to demonize and punish us for all the mistakes we've made, right? I mean, I tell my kids all the time, listen, daddy has screwed you up. I don't even know how, but when you find out, please, please, seriously, come talk to me. I want to own it. I want to know about it. And I want to apologize for it. So this is not going to be serious about punishing or blaming. In fact, it's going to be the opposite, but it is going to be about breaking some patterns from the past. And today it begins with learning to find the things our parents did right. I saw an interview years ago by Don Soquist, the COO of Walmart. He said in the early days, he and Sam would go scouring across the country from place to place to place to visit all the different Walmarts that were opening. And he said one of the things that always struck him about Sam Walton was his ability to find good in the midst of bad. One day as they were traveling the country, going from one store to the next, they stopped at this little podunk little strip, not even a mall, strip store, And as they went in, the place was a disaster. The signage was bad. Things were in boxes. Things were even taken out. Things were displayed poorly. The prices were hard to find. And Don was walking through the halls like, oh, my goodness, this is exactly how not to run a business. I mean, like we could take photos here, show it to our associates and say, here's what not to do. He looked around and Sam had disappeared about 10 minutes earlier. He found him down a a particular aisle amongst the boxes and the clutter, and Sam was down on one knee. And Don said, what are you doing? He goes, look at this lawn chair. We have got to carry this lawn chair. Look at the quality of this. Look at the way it's put together. We don't carry anything like this. Come, let's get the the UPC symbol on this, and, and let's order this and put this in our stores. And Don was like, you've got to be kidding. How did you find a gem 
that you want to actually take away from this experience when all I saw was sour grapes. But he said that was the key to Sam Walton's success. He always had the ability to find good in the midst of the bad. And I want to challenge you that that is a secret to relationships in life that God's going to inspire us with as well. God's going to tell us that there's three actions that we can go about in this process. Some things we need to stop, some things we need to start, and some things we need to actually scour to find. And in that, let me tell you what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you're going to find freedom and unlocking of some things that you don't even know that are holding you back. I know I found that as I began this journey myself over the last few months preparing for this. I went to lunch with a guy this week and he said, you know what? I wish I'd forgiven my father when he was alive, but I have forgiven my father. I said, why? He said, because bitterness can eat you alive and I want to be free. It begins with stop. It's a fascinating, untraveled passage in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, where God says, I want you to stop crying sour grapes. The word of the Lord came to me and he said, guys, you've got to stop using this proverb. What proverb's that? Everybody I keep hearing, God says, say this. Well, because the parents ate sour grapes, therefore the children's teeth are stained. Because my parents did bad things, I ended up with stained teeth. Thank you, mom and dad. And God says, I want you to no longer use that proverb. No longer blame your parents or your grandparents for who you are. I'm not saying they haven't influenced you, but stop using that proverb as if you're, you're destined to be who you currently are. But I'm telling you, you can change. I'm telling you, you are not what your past. Your yesterdays don't determine your tomorrows. Stop using that proverb. Just because your parents weren't good at emotions doesn't mean you can't learn from that. You might say, well, I'm not really good at connection. And that might be true. You might have to figure out why you're not good at connection. But you can be better at it. You might say, I don't do grief. Well, maybe you don't. But why is that? Why do you struggle with dealing with certain types of emotions? Or or why is your emotional list two things? Lust and anger. (laughs) I can't tell how many folks that really, those are the two emotions that they they know how to deal with. And they don't even deal with those well. Reminds me of that scene from Pretty Woman where Richard Gere turns to Julia Roberts and says, I'm very angry at my father. Mr. Lewis is very angry at his father, to which Julie Roberts says, wow, what led you to that conclusion? He said $10,000 in therapy, $10,000 in therapy, and all I got was, I'm angry at my father. Well, what's the next step? What about learning how to honor? What about learning how to learn from those things? Did, Did the things that got you angry, have you been able to unlock yourself from those or free those things? That's what God wants from us. See, anger can be a fuel that uh, keeps us from opening up, keeps us from connecting, keeping us from knowing how to deal with healthy issues in our life. And there's a great book that digs into this. It's by Dennis Rainey. It's called Tribute. It's about how to give tribute to our family of origin. It's a powerful book that gets into the details. Whether your parents have passed away, whether they're alive, whether you have a, a, a conflicted relationship or a difficult relationship or a great relationship, how do you write out and give tribute in such a way that brings freedom and health into your own life? It tells a story about Bill, who is a lawyer, came into his office one day, and he just looked, had it all. Had the Lexus, had the look, had the tailor suit. And his confidence in his professional life dimmed when he began to talk about his personal life. See, I just, I just cannot be open the way I want to be open and the way my wife needs. And I don't find myself connecting with my kids the way they need. I'm a high performer. I'm good at business. I just don't do this family thing right. To which Dennis says, well, tell me about your family growing up. And immediately his eyes went distant. He described a very difficult, emotionally unavailable relationship growing up. And Dennis shared with him the basis of this book, which we're going to walk through here in a few minutes together, um, sort of my version of it, is that the secret to dealing with the sour grapes of your past is learning how to see what your parents did right first. To humanize them. To realize, oh my goodness, they were just struggling with what they knew and what had been handed to them. And as we humanize our parents and find out what they did right, it brings freedom. And that's what he did. Bill began a process of of giving tribute to his dad and noticing the few things he did right, which unlocked him to be able to make some changes in his life later. So God says, number one, you've got to stop crying sour grapes. Stop blaming the past. And number two, you need to start some things. Because in the book of, uh, well, you have Ten Commandments, has one particular commandment that comes with a promise. If you will learn to honor, find the ripe grapes, your mother and father, your days will be long. 
He doesn't say that about not stealing. He doesn't say that about adultery. But it says, if you learn to find the things your parents and grandparents did right, even if it's only one thing, you'll have a long life, a successful life, a freed life, a, a life where you have the freedom to make changes you want to make. But it begins with the process of learning how to honor. So you stop cr- crying sour grapes and then you start scouring for ripe grapes. And God goes on. He says, so stop using that proverb because I want to tell you, if a man is just, he will surely live. If he makes changes, he'll surely live. But if that man, the righteous man, begets a son who's a robber and a shedder of blood and, and, and he, that robber, begets a son who sees all the mistakes his father has made, all the sins his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, I will honor that. And look at these two phrases. One, the secret is three generations. Grandpa begets father who begets son. If you go back three generations and you consider what's come before you, and if you see all of what's happened, it's the process of moving forward in a healthy way. This is the secret. If you put it on a a family tree chart, it might look like this. You have your grandfather. We have a man who's just. He begets a son who's not real great. So we had some good things passed on to us, and we had some bad things passed on to us. And that bad person begets a son, which is you. But if this person sees everything that his father and grandfather did and considers it, God will bring freedom and life into your life. So we're looking at two stages of that. Number one, we're going to look at some of the things that our parents have done before us in the vineyard and our grandparents, and we're going to say, you know what, that worked for them. I'm not sure how it works for them, because that communication style seems very dysfunctional. But you know what, it worked for them. But I'm going to acknowledge that, I'm going to identify that, but I'm going to choose in my family to leave that behind. Other things I'm going to look through the family vineyard and say, you know what, that thing, that character quality, that pattern, that habit, I want to carry that forward. That's what honoring means. You find the things in your family you want to carry forward, and that might be 90%, that might be 2%, but you find the ripe grapes. And then you find the things that are sour grapes, we'll talk about in a few weeks, that you want to leave behind. So I want to walk you through that process. This is going to be a very much workshop interactive type series. So as you came in today, we gave you a genogram or a family vine. If you want to pull that out, I'm going to put mine up on the screen. I'm going to walk you through it. And we are going to try together to scour our family vineyard. And specifically, we're going to look for, we're going to try and find two ripe grapes, two character qualities, ripe grapes from six family vines. Now, some of you are going to talk about your dad or your mother or your grandmother or your grandfather. You're going to say, oh, my goodness, it was easy. I couldn't just do two. I did five. I did ten. There's going to be somebody else in your family tree. You're like, mm, I can't think of one. So I want to walk you through my family tree. And keep in mind, my family listens to these CDs. So in this series, I'm going to be as open and as honest as I can because I want to help you be open and honest about the process. So what we're going to do is we're going to, if you see at the bottom of your page, you have a list of words, character qualities down there. So those are on, we'll put those up on the screen as well. I'm going to walk through my family tree, and as I do that, some words might strike you. Yeah, that was my grandmother. Yeah, that was my dad. I'm going to talk about things that look very sour, how you can find ripe in the midst of it. So as I'm talking, if you see some words that that fit your grandparents, we're going to start with my father's side, and then we're going to do my mother's side. And then I'm going to give you some specific time to reflect and have some time to think with some of those words coming up on the screen. All right? So let me start with my dad's side. So my grandfather, his name was Bob, or Robert, Bob Hovind. And the thing about Bob Hovind is that, uh, well, I love my, my grandpa. He had a basement full of trains and puzzles. He loved having fun. He loved solving things. He was an engineer. He actually had a pocket protector and was proud of it. Like every day he like put on his pocket protector and loved that thing. I like I don't know that I knew Grandpa real much, but boy, we had fun together. And so the, the character qualities of my grandpa are actually are pretty easy because my grandpa loved to teach. He loved and he wasn't a teacher, he was an electrical engineer and a marine, but he loved to teach. And so to, to build you up and his way of working with you was just was just a wonderful thing that got passed on to my dad and got passed on to me. So teacher is definitely one that comes up from my grandfather. And the second thing with that is my grandpa was an incredible problem solver. Now there's definitely some sour grapes. I mean there's some real awkward positions I got put in when my grandfather was uh, had diabetes. He was hiding one pound chocolate bars all over the house. And uh, 
It was funny, except Grandma thought he was going to die, which maybe he was, but I got put in the awkward position in eighth grade because I could drive his golf cart where he would beg me, I mean, beg me to go and buy him one-pound chocolate bars. And my grandmother would pull me aside and say, if you buy that chocolate bar, you're killing Grandpa. (laughs) Yeah. I can laugh at it now, but at the time, I remember being put in really awkward family situations that I wanted to please my Grandpa. I'm like, you know, if you're going to die, I want to die by chocolate, quite frankly. And yet feeling the guilt and shame of, oh my goodness, I'm going to kill grandpa. So, for me, teacher and problem solvers went for my grandfather. Now, my grandma, honestly, it's harder to find. There's a lot more sour grapes with grandma. I mean, grandma was incredibly cheap. She was, had very little self-awareness. She knew every problem everybody else had, but never had anything she needed to change. She was candid. She was blunt. Uh, to give you an example, she would give me a Christmas card. Not just me. All of us with a Christmas card looked like this. Or it's a happy birthday card, too. Happy birthday. Dear Ross, Diane, Holly, Ryan, Chad, happy 12th birthday. My grandma reused the cards that she gave out every year. And that's how thrifty and cheap she was. When she died, we actually went down to my grandma's uh, library. She had a library of Christian books. And so we're pulling out her Christian books. As we pull out each one of the books... Written in the margin of every page was, Ross needs to work on this. Lynn needs to work on this. Robert needs to work on this. No place in all the books, and I looked through hundreds of them, did I own ever need to work on anything. And you know, I could be bitter by that, the lack of self-awareness, the defensiveness. But I have learned to honor my grandmother for what she did right. And I'll tell you a few things. My grandma, the sour grape is that she was really blunt. But I tell you the thing I'm going to honor her for is her candidness. A lot of families have a lot of family games. What do you mean? What do you not mean? One of the things I can honor about my grandma is her candidness. So as you're thinking about your family, there might be the thing that annoys you. There might be an actual ripe grape in the midst of that. The second thing about my grandmother that I can really honor is that she was thrifty. Oh, my goodness. She started her own business, uh, Hoban Realty, was very, very successful, and that thriftiness made her an incredible entrepreneur. But I tell you the other one, I'll do three for Grandma, is competitiveness. I love card games today because of my grandmother. We used to play canasta together. She taught me cribbage together. And I tell you, it didn't matter if you were two years old or 12, Grandma beat the snot out of you. (laughs) And I didn't actually think about this, honestly, until um, my grandma's funeral. I remember uh, going to my grandma's funeral, and I remember my sister standing up to uh, talk at the, the, the eulogy, and she said, you know, my competitive spirit as a volleyball player came from my grandmother. She said she loved to win, and when you beat grandma when you were four or 14, you knew you'd really won. Grandma never let you win. And the spirit of competitiveness we got from our grandmother was just so powerful. And she said, it's made me who I am. And I thought of all the sour grapes in grandma's life, and there was lots. That, was, that really is true. My sense of competitiveness, both business and personally, and games really came from her. So those are from my grandma. And I'll tell you about my father. My father's name is Ross. And honestly, for me, it's very easy to find things. One of the things for my dad is that, in fact, in preparing for this, you might want to do this yourself. I actually asked my son to do this with me, and I asked my wife to do this with me. And it was very interesting to see our lists were pretty similar. My dad's sense of ingenuity which I'm spelling wrong, ingenuity, um, was incredible. I mean, his creativity to solve a problem in a very unconventional way was just amazing. Put the E back in there. Um, my dad, just like my grandfather, was an incredible problem solver. And the other thing about my father, he was a highly involved father. In fact, even at age 43 or whatever I am, um, my dad still calls, consults, anything going on, not overbearing, just, hey, he's interested in my life. So those are some of the ones from my family. And for some of you, you're going to say, well, Chad, good for you. I'm glad you had some good things in your family. It's harder for me. Even if you have to push a little bit, I want to really encourage you to find one or two words from that list that you can say that's the ripe grape in the midst of some sour ones. So I'm going to do is I'm going to have Kenny come out, and he's going to play a little uh, on his uh, looping software and on the guitar here for us. And I'm going to have some of the words on the bottom of the screen come up for about two or three minutes as we reflect. And if you want to grab a pen, there's some pencils in front of you. And if you don't want to write it down because you don't want people to see, again, it's easier today when we're honoring than when we do sour grapes in a few weeks. But I want you to really take a few minutes and reflect. And we've placed on here some step uh, grandfather or step 
mother. And you might say, well, there wasn't any divorce back then, or not lot. But Grandpa may have died in the war. Both my grandfather served in the war. And so maybe there was a, a, a widow, or maybe there was a mentor that influenced your father. So feel free to use that if you had more of a blended family to use those to your advantage. But let's at least do these three together on a father's side if you can. A grandfather or a mentor, grandmother, and your father. And I'm going to do the same and write some down for the next few minutes. amazing seeing that list up on screen i just uh had several more that really struck me they went with a couple of my family members again i know for some of us it's like wow i don't ever take the time to slow down think about that god has really given me an awful lot in my family other times you're like well i really didn't feel like i knew my father or my grandfather enough to fill this out i just want to encourage you i'll do my mother's side and we'll give you a chance to do the same so my mom's side um my grandfather's name was uh, was larry and uh, Larry, uh, on the sour grape side, Larry was very stoic. He was very Lutheran. And uh, part of him being very Lutheran and, and having been in World War II is he didn't express a lot of emotion. And so because of that, probably my mom never heard him say, I love you or I'm proud of you. Um, and so that would be the sour grapes. It would be easy to blame or say, oh, my goodness. But the ripe grape is that my grandfather was one of the most generous people I know even though the generosity did not come out through his words. My mom tells a story of the first year of marriage. They got married, and my grandfather, who was an incredibly hard worker, was you know lower middle class at best, and he said, what do you guys need for your first year of marriage? 
My mom made this long list of every conceivable thing they might need to pass out for all the Christmas lists. They showed up that Christmas, and the Christmas tree always had a lot of presents. Gift-giving was a huge part of, of the ultra Vogue side of the family. But the, 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 the pile that year was just higher than ever. And as my mom was opening gifts, she got... Uh, she just opened and opened hour after hour. And she got to the end of the list, and it struck her. Grandpa had bought every single thing on the list. And it's probably why gift-giving is such a huge part of my mom's love language is because though Grandpa wasn't good at, at, at uh, encouraging words, man, he was generous. I remember uh, the first person that I knew that died, really, that I was close to, I was in sixth grade, and I remember, uh, I remember his father actually was still alive. I remember being in that room and hearing my great-grandfather say those words I'd never heard before, no father should outlive their son. Didn't know my grandfather a lot, but boy, I felt loved by him. He was incredibly generous, even though it didn't come through words, and he was incredibly hardworking. My grandmother, um, Eileen is her name, uh, loved Eileen, and I tell you, one of the first things that comes to mind when I think of my grandma is fun. Oh my goodness, uh, both my grandmothers, but this grandma, we played uh, backgammon all the time, and every time we played backgammon, I, I have her backgammon board still. I open it up, and I can smell being back in her house. And uh, every time we'd open up the backgammon board, Grandma Eileen would say, are we going to play ACDC? I'm, I'm sorry, not ACDC, AC DC. <laughs> she might want to play ACDC, too. Are we going to play ACDC, which is a version of backgammon? We always play. I'm like, yeah, Grandma, we'll play ACDC. And she's like, oh, good, I love ACDC. Oh, I know you do, Grandma. That's so why we play. We play ACDC together, and, and then we play Farkle, which is, uh, her version was called Greed, and just fun. And Grandma had this organ. She loved to sing. She loved to play the organ. She had this ability to be, just really bring hospitality and we ate a lot at Grandma's house. Now, Grandma had some sour grapes, too, some enabling relationships related to some relatives that were very dysfunctional for her and for them. But the ripe grapes in the midst of that are, man, Grandma was fun, and that spirit of fun really flowed through the family vine to me and a real sense of hospitality. Now, my mother um, is probably one of the best listeners, so I could put empathy here, I could put compassion here, I could put listener here. I asked my son and my wife, and they all said the same thing. Yeah, that is your mom. Just incredible empathy. And a great listener, and a great sense of compassion. She also is incredible logic. Her ability to think through things is just amazing. And she's probably one of the most others-centered people I know. And, you know, a lot of what I do I got from my dad, a lot of who I am I got from my mom. And I'm very proud of both those aspects. I remember uh, a moment when I got home from college. I'll talk more about this on the weekend sour grapes. But sort of the stoicism that flowed from my grandpa. Um, my mom and dad showed me love in a lot of ways. But we weren't really a family that said I love you out loud. I never felt really unloved, honestly, just because we, we showed it in so many other ways. Interest and attention and encouragement. But I remember in college, after I got married, I decided I was going to change that. I decided every time I was on the phone, before I got off the phone, I was going to say, I love you, Mom, or I love you, Dad. And it felt very awkward. I'm like, why does this feel awkward? Like, I, I love my mom and dad. Why is it awkward to say that? Because there's this family heritage that you don't talk like that. And I remember I was 22, and I just, every time I got off the phone, I love you, Mom. You too. Next time, I love you too. And now, 20 years later, I got to tell you, the ability to say I love you, as simple as that is, has changed our family legacy because of one little thing, seeing how this influence it wasn't that Grandpa was bad. I'm sure if I was in World War II and had to see what he said, it might be hard to talk about it too. But said, from this point on, we're going to change some things moving forward. And that's what I'm hoping. As you begin to tribute, give tribute to people in the past, you're able to go, oh my goodness, things don't have to be the same in the future. So I'm going to give you one more uh, time of reflection, and I'm going to have Kenny come back out, and I want you to, again to just fill out in your sheet uh, different, at least two character qualities that go with your mother's side of the family as well. Let's watch the video together.
Well, as you look at your family tree or family vineyard, uh, maybe you've just never done this before, uh, and most people haven't. Look at that list. Even if it was hard to do with a few people, look at the heritage, the good heritage, the good grapes that God has, has given to you. And I'm not saying there aren't bad things in that, but part of the process of thanking God for what's gone well and what's been given to you unlocks you to be able to deal with the sour grapes in a way where you're not linked to it, you're not reacting to it, you're not repeating it, which we'll look at together. So whether this was a hard exercise to you, I would encourage you to use this sheet to talk with your spouse, to talk with your kids. Uh, we just have had some great conversations here as we begin this week. Well, tell you, I'd like you to and make this real practical. I know for some of us this was like, oh, my goodness, it's so uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. Hopefully you're not going to do this every week. Um, so I'd like you to hear a, a story of somebody who's sort of gone through this process, looking at his family in the last couple of years, and how that's impacted him. So can we give a, a warm welcome uh, to my friend Trey? Trey and I have been friends for 15 years. He's one of the first people I met when I uh, came and was hired here. And we have done everything together, water ski together, hung out together, and uh, you know, problem solved together over the years. And um, Tell us about your family growing up and sort of what your reflections were most of your life on that. Yeah, I think we came from a, a good family. It was a, a very disciplined family. Uh, my dad uh, was a hard worker and had a strong work ethic. He was an executive. And so I think a lot of my work ethic you know, clearly came from mm-hmm. him. My mom worked hard, too. And yeah. so, you know, we were um, a very even-tempered family. Mm-hmm. When a lot of, I, I remember one time uh, my mom was just talking to me like I am now, but there was this little tone infliction. I was saying, Mom, quit yelling at, quit yelling at me. I'm like, <laughs> she never yelled. Gotcha. You know? So, uh, yeah, so we were very, um, you know, uh, involved in the church. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I grew up, you know, serving the church. And so, again, I think... Uh, Everybody that looked at our family would say we were normal, and I thought we were normal. Yeah. yeah. And so it wasn't, it wasn't hard for you to come up with good characteristics of yeah. your family. Yeah. Not at all. And so about 30 years ago, you told me that your brother called you. Yeah. And uh, tell me a little about what happened there. Yeah, so my younger brother was going through a very difficult time in his life with, with a relationship. And, um, and so he went to counseling uh, mm-hmm. to, to save this and, and, and really opened the lid on sort of why he was feeling the way he was and why he is the way he was. And, and he wanted to talk to someone about it, yeah. someone who grew up with him. He's my younger brother, two years younger. And, um, and he started talking to me about some things that maybe weren't so positive about mom and dad. Yeah. And, uh, boy, I took offense to that. I thought he was being really dishonoring. Hmm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about that. I just hmm. I actually kind of just shut the conversation down huh. uh, because I felt like that that was not fair to, to mm-hmm. talk that way and that wasn't the way we talked about people in our family. And hmm. so um, I, I feel bad about that now, but mm-hmm. uh, that's what I did, and I don't, he didn't have anybody to talk to about it. Yeah, and in what ways do you feel bad? So one, you weren't able to connect with him as he won his right. empathy, and then what ways uh, did you rob yourself of an opportunity? Well, I, I definitely robbed myself of that opportunity to maybe dive a little deeper into some things that maybe shaped why I am the way I am. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I was sharing with you, I read in a book that uh, normal is only a setting on a hair dryer or on a uh, dryer. A dryer, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and so, I, but I thought we were normal. You know? Sure. So, yeah. um, so then last year, um, I started going to um, the men's study on Tuesday mornings uh, where Doug really began to dive into um, what it takes to be a, a man. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, we eventually develop a manhood plan as part of that. And so Doug uh, just does this great job. He's so transparent and authentic about his own childhood and how it influenced him today, and not in a negative way, but mm-hmm. in a positive way. So one, after one of the sessions, I, I, I stopped him out here in the foyer and I said, Doug, how can you be so transparent and, and articulate so well, you know, what's happened to you in your childhood and how it has affected you today and how you're dealing with it. Yeah. And he said, well, that's, you know, easy. It's, it's, it's about 10 years and thousands of dollars worth of counseling. <laughs> <laughs> but it struck you uh, that he seemed to be aware of what had influenced yeah. him and was able to again, carry some things forward and leave some things behind. Right. And I know you said, as we've talked, the last couple of years you have been journaling. As a, uh, Trey used to read all my messages for the last 10 years. He'd give me feedback before I delivered them. And almost every time I did something that involved introspection, he'd be like, nobody wants to do that. Let's cut that out. And uh, so the last couple of years, God's sort of grown you in the area of introspection. Yeah. And tell me what you've learned or are learning and what maybe you missed out by not taking that opportunity 30 years ago with your brother. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Doug really started the process, and it's it's a process that will always continue because I will never be really good at um, 
sharing my emotions. But what, I, what I've realized is that I, I do have emotions, but I've never never known how to articulate them. Hmm. And uh, uh, and and so you know, in dealing with my kids and and my wife, uh, you know, they're emotional people. Um, I've kind of I I think I actually look down on emotions. Hmm. Um, now in work, that's actually great. Uh, you know, as an executive. Uh, every time I get tested by an industrial psychologist, they say, wow, you are like off the charts in terms of emotional control. That's uh-huh. good. You know, and so performance reviews, you know, man, you're, you're, you're great in that emotional control area. Right. The reality is I have emotions, but I run from them. I sweep mm-hmm. them under the rug. I stay busy. And mm-hmm. so what I'm trying to begin to learn to do is to be a human being, not just a human doer. Yeah. Because, you know, staying busy, yeah, I can kind of hide it and cover it for a while and run mm-hmm. away from it, but it's still there. Hmm. So um, so at, it, at home now I have a, a, a list of words that we call soul words. Uh-huh. And so, you know, uh, my wife will say, well, Trey, how do you feel about that? I'm like, oh, gosh, here we go again. <laughs> um, but I know I need to. I need to do that. So I, where's my list? Where's my list? And so I get the list, and, and actually it helps. Mm-hmm. It's these words that I can articulate a feeling that I'm having, mm-hmm. and this is all new to me. Yeah. Well, I remember one of the things we, we met three or four months ago, you said, Chad, I realize a lot of my life I, I've, I've lived my life like a machine, just yeah. do and accomplish, and that's great, yeah. but I've learned I, I've missed out on opportunities to connect. Yeah. So if you're going to encourage somebody that maybe it's in the same place you have been up until a couple of years ago to oh, just sitting there going, a bunch of psycho babble, oh, my goodness, please, wife, don't listen to this. We're not going to apply this. Why might you encourage? How have you gotten freer, or how is your life on this beginning of a journey moving in a healthier way because of this? Well, uh, first off, I'd like to put a plug in for the men's uh, study on Tuesday morning. So we just started last week. You've missed nothing if you start this Tuesday, 609, and we had 55 people last Tuesday. So I'm really excited about this year. It's about how to be uh, success at home and at work. And I think I've been a success at work. Mm-hmm. I want to learn how to be a success at home. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think I have been, but not, you know, not as much as, much as I could have been. So yeah. you know, part of it starts out with just you know, finding out kind of what isn't normal yeah. um, and admitting that. You know, mm-hmm. And that transparency, is, that authenticity is kind of freeing. So mm-hmm. I started out with my kids. You know, I, I just told them, hey, here's what I'm learning about myself. And I probably affected you negatively mm-hmm. in that yeah. way, too. And, and you know, uh, some of them, uh, my middle son... Uh, Actually, he's always been really in touch with his feelings, so he didn't get that from me. Right. But, um, but I, I've watched him. I've learned from him how he is dealing with his son, and he calls it feel and deal. You know, mm. feel, feel the feeling and then just deal with it. You know, mm. don't pretend it doesn't exist. Mm. Don't run away from it. Mm. So that's what I want to learn how to do, yeah. and uh, I'm doing that with my kids and with my spouse, and hopefully mm. you know, we can overcome some things maybe I passed on that weren't that positive, and mm. then they can do better with our seven grandkids. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's amazing how you can even learn as a grandparent, you know, the things that you didn't learn earlier on. Right. Well, great. Well, let me close this in prayer, and maybe if you want to go on this journey with us for the next six weeks, it will be so much cheaper than thousands of dollars of counseling, and it will be, I promise you, so much more effective as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have given us a plan, uh, a way in which that we can move forward to honor what's come before us, but also create something honorable for those who come after us. And, Father, we ask you to give us the courage to face sour grapes in our past, and you give us the courage to find the rape, or the ripe grapes uh, hidden amongst the, uh, the vineyard. And Father, in all these things, we want that promise you promised in Exodus, that you would give us a long life when we learn to honor those who aren't always that honorable. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. All right, can we thank Trey for being here? Appreciate it, Trey. Thank you. And again, thank you for being with us today for Fine Wine. We'll see you all next week. If you came prepared to give us some offering boxes on the way out. If you're new to the church, we'd love to say hi. The third door on your left is the hearth room. Thanks again.